Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a action-packed lecture for you today. Um, should note that unlike the 2019 class, there's a, a lot of new content that's been installed uh, this week. Uh, used to be we covered indoles through two lectures, but that has changed. So we're gonna try to cover about a lecture and a half of data today in this one lecture. We're gonna be talking about pyridines on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we're gonna talk all about uh, as indoles, which are kind of like the mixture of a pyridine and indole, and it'll be a first exposure to fused heterocycles. So in the past, indoles were something that uh, I got right into and went straight to the case studies because most people were already familiar with a lot of ways of making indoles. Um, you've already been instructed to take a look at the PCC book before these classes, so I'm sure you've seen this nice starburst that kind of summarizes all the various ways of making indoles, and you'll have those at your disposal today. But uh, what we've done this year is try to give you a little box of strategy, which helps you try to navigate the various ways that uh, people can put together indoles in such a way that it aids you in the retrosynthetic simplification. So the way I like to think about these is in terms of which substituents I can remove first, having the optionality there, often breaking back to CH disconnections. Because if you can remove one of the two substituents, either the nitrogen or the carbon of the indole, it can have a dramatic simplification on the rest of the synthesis. So take, for example, a good, a good um, typical example of a CH kind of disconnection would be Hemmetsberger, where the Hemmetsberger intermediate can, of course, come from simply an aryl aldehyde. The Sunberg, however, is far less employed because you need this aryl azide. However, there are other reactions that also give you essentially the same type of CH functionalization disconnection, and that are reactions that go by paracyclic reaction mechanisms, such as the Fischer, where now we have a CH bond where there was before a carbon-carbon bond, and things like Bartoli, where you've got that nice CH bond there, as well as Gassman. Condensations take advantage of sort of the innate reactivity. So in many cases, we'll see examples where you have very easy availability to a aryl nitro compound bearing an alkyl, often a methyl group, rendering this methyl group far more acidic than usual, such that reaction with something like DMF, DMA at uh, gentle heating, with a little bit of base can give you that adduct, which after reduction of the nitro group spontaneously cyclizes and loses dimethylamine. So that's a really useful way of taking advantage of these readily available ortho alkyl nitro compounds. And um, finally, one of the most popular ways of making indoles is of course using uh, Laroque, Heck, Castro type reactions wherein an ortho halo aniline is reacted with an alkyne. And um, these ortho halo anilines can be accessed of course from the corresponding uh, aniline. And there are a lot of ways of doing ortho iodination or ortho halogenation of those, either through conditions which are accentuated towards electrophilic aromatic substitution in the ortho position or through directed methylation type strategies. So probably of all of these, the most popular is likely the Laroc. Uh, that's a disconnection you can use quite a bit, uh, followed by the Fischer, and then maybe Lime Gruber, Madelung type, and then finally uh, Hammetsberger, although that latter reaction is best used in a medicinal chemistry context. So with this little background of strategery, let's go right into the case studies. So for the first compound here, uh, let's take a look at the ring system. We've got a pyran connected to an indole. That indole has four and seven substitution. And the first thing we wanna do is dramatically simplify this compound. And in order to do that, we need an indole expert. And um, I have a feeling that uh, Tawe will, will be that person this morning. So when you look at this compound, what would be the first disconnection that you would make in order to rapidly get us back down to something more simple? How about um, Sung Han? Uh, I think I will disconnect the quaternary carbon and the oxygen yeah. bond. 
And you know you can do that because of the lecture we had before, which states that um, that 2, 3 pi bond is simply primed for such a reaction. And I'm also going to get rid of that nitrile and just put a bromo there, knowing we can do some sort of cross coupling there. And that leads me back to a simple ketone, which upon treatment with BF3 etherate, will do a kind of pictet spangler like reaction, Friedel Crafts reaction, and generate that nice quaternary center. Now, with that compound in hand, we need a good way to put the indole together. And we have a whole menu of options above. So would someone like to offer a suggestion for a good reaction for doing this? Perhaps, uh, perhaps Debbie can help us out with that. Yeah, I mean, we can even use a Fischer indole. If you protect the alcohol and you disconnect uh, uh, you know, the indole ring, you can use Fischer, I guess. You want to use that aldehyde? Yeah. Well, it turns out that aldehyde is basically just dihydrofuran hiding. Hmm. I see. So that is exactly right. We can take uh, dihydrofuran, which is basically upon, upon the conditions of Fischer serves as a surrogate for that. It leads us to the intermediate that um, everyone knows and loves from a Fischer reaction. And we all know how this works. I think we talked about it in the context of something else before. And um, this compound, of course, can easily re-aromatize and lose ammonia to give the product. Questions from the outside? I think you might have used the wrong uh, polymer uh, Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, before we do that. Thanks, Tucker. Remove these arrows. So we tautomerize and get that compound, which loses ammonia and gives you the product. Very similar to the trophimo synthesis of, of uh, furans that we saw before. We'll see this kind of uh, strategy um, used over and over. And I should remind you that this intermediate, just like pyrroles and furans, is basically a 1,4 dicarbonyl hiding. Fischer, one of the oldest reactions out there, actually Fischer uh, popularized, if not invented, the hydrazine. It's the reason we even have fume hoods. Uh, those were uh, invented as a consequence of these compounds being rather toxic. And um, they realized the fume hood was probably a good idea. All right, let's move on to a Metchem versus process disconnection of this compound here, which was a key intermediate in the synthesis of a Merck uh, clinical candidate. So problem of the day number one asks, uh, what is going on in this particular reaction? It looks like a fairly simple Fischer indolization, but um, because it's a problem of the day, something must be weird. In fact, in the problem of the day, it says identify all three products that are formed. So um, we need a good medicinal chemist. Maybe, um, maybe Ellie can help us out on what those three products might be. Yeah, so um, it's like the Fisher indole synthesis you just did. Um, so the hydrazine um, is formed. Um, Yeah, and then, 
you can you can tautomerize um, either way on the um, enamine. So that would lead to two of the three products. Nice. Either way. Let's see what you're talking about here. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. That's the other way. Okay, and this one, I guess, after does its fissure, will give us the right compound. And uh, this one gives something strange, doesn't it? Yeah, so you'd have a, a quaternary carbon, and then you couldn't um, make your indole. So that's product number one. That's product number two. What's product number three? Um, I think it's that one of the nitrogens uh, attacks your ester. Hmm. That's product three. Fantastic. Thanks, Ellie. This is great for medicinal chemistry. The problem with Fisher is often controlling regiochemistry and getting really high yield. Uh, Fisher has been used in process chemistry in certain cases. And uh, there are, I think, at least at this point, uh, three chem reviews just on Fisher and the different acids you can use. So you could run a screen of a thousand different acids and it would give you different regiochemical outcomes, different yield um, profiles. And so in many cases, this is a good reaction for medicinal chemistry, but for process, when you get small amounts of impurities, it could be less than desirable. So Fisher is best used in process scale where there is no regiochemical ambiguity. So let's take a look at how process chemists uh, disconnected this molecule. The medicinal chemists did a great job of getting the compound quickly. They probably didn't know what stereochemistry they needed. So it made sense to just make the racemic compound separate and figure out, let the biology tell you what enantiomer you need. And then with the target defined, now the process chemist can go forward. And so we need a different disconnection thinking about how to put this in place. So when we think about this stereocenter right here, what are our good options for putting that stereocenter in? Uh, Jun Chen, any ideas? Yeah, the, the demand is how to make the enamide, uh, enamine selectively. So what we try here, first step should be uh, make the tertiary amine. A tertiary hydrazine. Well, uh, just give me a, a dis. I want to understand, Jun Chen, uh, how am I to address that stereocenter? According to your to the scheme you show, it should. Well, be I don't want you to look at the scheme. <laughs> okay, so give me some ideas. Uh, you have to make it before you do the Fisher. Uh, in those synthesis. Oh, is that right? If I, if I do it before the Fisher synthesis, then I might have the problem of scrambling of that stereocenter, right? Because we know what so Ellie told us. So you have to control in, in the mean, I mean, you uh, put something. That's going to be hard. So maybe you can make the left one. Maybe you can make what? Sorry? Maybe make the left one and you do the 3 3, you will get the right product. 
Yeah, so you're saying try to make this compound discreetly, which brings us back to, you know, maybe trying some sort of almond reaction. You mean like that? Yeah, but not with free uh, hydrazine. Not with a free hydrazine, but, but still, I would argue that this compound might be a little bit complicated to make. That's not so straightforward. Yeah, but, but if you have some uh, SN2, uh, yeah, SN2 reaction, it will be easy because you ah, just need SN2 a- SN2 how? So some leaving group. You mean like that? Yes. Great. And then this compound, can simply come back. But maybe maybe not on the indo because I'm not sure if indo will do something where like you're worried about some sort of uh, quinomethide like thing and losing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe that's definitely a concern. But uh, that's what they did. They took that risk. Easy enough to find out if uh, let's say you make the corresponding alcohol. Uh, so this can be or OH here, where you make the alcohol and then do a Mitsunobu. And uh, this basically can be drawn back from a malinate. We know malinate is a great donor to Mitsunobu. And that's what they did. Um, you can imagine other possibilities for this are thinking about making the, the corresponding olefin there and then trying to do hydrogenation. However, the challenge with that is now you've got the easy stereoselectivity of that olefin that needs to be defined for a lot of hydrogenation conditions. And you've got this annoying bromine atom that could be a chemoselectivity issue when you do the resulting hydrogenation. So they chose this route. Process chemists took this uh, beta keto ester treated with sodium hydroxide. They took this aniline and upon treatment with sodium nitrate that does something to the aniline. Stone, what does that do? How uh, you form the diacer? Okay, and we form the anion here. And um, what's that? What are those two going to do when they uh, get joined together in a flask stone? Uh, the um, that that position is going to attack the diazo. And then okay. I guess you can get um, saponification and decarboxylation. There you go. This is known as the Jap-Klingman reaction. You're going to see this a lot. It's a very nice way of getting uh, defined hydrozones that would be difficult to make in other ways. So for example, you may look at this and say, well, Phil, I don't understand. Why don't they just use this? That's not a very stable compound. It's not very nice to use. Um, it auto oxidizes pretty readily to catechol and uh, you're likely not to get a very defined happy mixture. Whereas this approach is far better because you get defined formation of the hydrozone, which can then be employed in a Fischer indolization, which after treatment with benzyl chloride, gives the product. Subsequently, you can do exactly what we talked about before. CBS reduction takes place with very high EE and then Mitsunobu reaction gives you this product. And then after that, decarboxylation and removal of the benzyl group gives you your product. Uh, hey, hey, Phil, do they need the benzyl group to direct the CBS reduction? Uh, I think the CBS group is mainly uh, used, uh, sorry, the benzyl group is mainly used not necessarily for the um, CBS reduction, another 
to make life easier and less complicated in the Mitsunobu reaction. Also want to mention that all seven steps here are done without any intermediate purification, without any chromatography, no isolation. The magicians in Merck process chemistry simply went straight from the materials you see on top all the way to the product in one telesco telescope stream. Really, really beautiful process chemistry here from a few years ago. Question, Question from the outside. What do you say, Max? Uh, Johnny wants to know what scale was this process? Was. Kilogram. Kilogram, cool. Yep. I have no idea what is the fate of this compound and whether it went to an FDA approved medicine, but this was uh, at least in phase one. All right, let's move on to some. Uh, hey, yes. Sorry. Um, back in the uh, tetrahedral intermediate, I guess may maybe more of a general question. How is there a way to control uh, the regiochemistry of the um, release of the hydrozone? Because I guess you could you could have it attacking the ketone or the ester. And maybe for other systems, it would be more difficult to control. Yeah, usually um, the exocyclic substituent is the one that's going to be released. And Jap claimant can have uh, an ester. You also see manifestations we'll see later where they have an acetyl group. Uh, but usually the rule of thumb is the exocyclic one will depart. And if you have a keto ester, so for instance, if you do a Jap Klingman with something like this, that's going to be the one that depart to depart. Okay, thank you. Yep. Great question. Uh, just a quick question, Phil, not really, really related to the synthesis, but more sure. like how often do you see a diazonium intermediate on process scale? Because, like, I'm, I mean, that's a highly energetic intermediate, and like you want to avoid it on process, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, you see diazoniums a lot, and it does require extra work for the process chemist because they need to de risk it, make sure that the DSC of that compound is well above the range, usually within. I think 80 to 100 degrees outside the range where there would be a energetic event. And often they will simply telescope it. So make it in situ. An emerging trend these days is to do it in flow chemistry where the safety issues are largely ablated. But you still see diazonium chemistry. If you look in OPRD, you'll still see those things come out with regularity. Uh, it's desirable to avoid them, but in some cases they're strategically employed and don't pose a problem. But if you go into process chemistry one day, uh, you'll want to just simply take the extra steps to make sure that there's no energetic event and that that intermediate diazonium is safe. Okay, thank you. Hey, Phil, sorry sorry to keep you on this problem. Sure, Dan, um, what's up? But I've, I've seen cases where the hydrozone intermediate is uh, C to Z protected and then uh, cyclized would the CBZ protection help with the cyclization in the uh, kind of with with the Thorpe Ingold effect in any way in adding steric bulk? So the CBZ, you mean on uh, which of these nitrogens? This one or this the, the one you have? Uh, the second one. A or B? Uh, B. Um. Yeah. It's true that can be, you know, people have put tozzle there. You can put various substituents there. And you, you may be right that the, the conditions may be a little more mild to get that one to go. Um, but I'm not aware of that being a general strategy to just make Fisher in general that much better. Um, it's a good question. We, we can look into that. Uh, it certainly wouldn't necessarily hurt things so so much to put a CBZ or a tazel on there, but we can look into that and get back to you. Yeah, it's a good good question. Uh, the issue is often just making that compound, so it requires an extra step to put that that acyl group on there. Okay, other questions. Let's move on to some real world problems uh, from the archive. And um, so for the first one here, uh, what, what do you think when you see this molecule? Um, how about Neur? 
Um, and uh, remembering the sort of box of strategery we had at the beginning. I might go with Metalong uh, to disconnect the two and three. And now what? So the the pitfall of using Madelong here is that you really didn't simplify it, did you? Yeah, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. So it's not necessarily a bad disconnection to keep in the back of your pocket there and maybe search on SciFinder or search your internal stock room at your company to see if you've got something like that hanging around. But Overall, it didn't really make your life that much easier, even if we consider that maybe this AR could just come back from a, a halide like a bromide. Still, you've got this tetra substituted arian. So what we really want to think about are ways that we can get rid of complexity quickly. And so when I look at this molecule, I think to myself, okay, well, that's going to be a my bond formation where you can get, get rid of that really quickly. That can be a simple alkylation event. We can get rid of that pretty quickly. And um, that leads us at least to a tiny bit of complexity reduction, where we now have ester here, NH there. And if you guys go back to your box of strategy at the top, this can, of course, be a bromo or any halogen you want. That is an immediate signaling element for a reaction that would give us CH functionalization logic access. Via Hemetsberger. So the Hemetsberger, as we saw above, goes via the intermediacy of this azidoester, which when you heat it up, gives you a nitrine intermediate that does a CH insertion. In the old days, you used to need to heat those reactions up pretty high, but in newer events uh, over the past 10 or 15 years, you can now use metal catalysts like rhodium to render those reactions uh, room temperature or very mild, 50 degrees. So for, for medicinal chemistry, this is great because that aldehyde, if you search it, is actually pretty cheap and available. Let's go to the next one. This is one I see quite often. This type of problem is one I see quite often. So uh, Daniel, when you look at this molecule, what, which of these substituents do you think is the hardest one? I would say the four cyclopropyl. Because? Um, I can't really think of it. It's either four or three. Um, I can't think of any off, off the top of my head at this moment that. Well, I'm going to give you a hint in that actually the hardest one really here when I look at it is C6. And the reason I look at that that way is because I think to myself, well, if I'm going to use any kind of, let's say, Fisher or condensation approach from a compound like that, What is the problem, Daniel? What's the problem of starting, of this being your starting material to get to that? Um, do you know which side it's gonna go on when I do, let's say, uh, yeah. or let's say I try to do Lorac and put an iodine here or here. I've got a big regiochemical quandary, don't I? Yeah. So when I see a system like this, I, all I see in my head is an arene that has one, two, three substituents here. And then para to it is some group. 
And that should be to, to you in the modern era, a signaling event for a iridium borrelation. So now we can just cut this away, put a boron there, and that leads us not to this starting material, but rather And we know the iridium borrelation is only going to go away from the other substituents to so put a boron there, which we can immediately uh, do any kind of coupling you want. And this, then we can use some, take whatever your favorite is, example is from the table. You can take that and do a Laroc or Castro type, whatever you like. Hey, Phil, are there any other methods of functionalizing the C6 position outside of that uh, iridium borrelation? That are reliable? Uh, there are some ways. So um, there are some emerging methodologies that would put a directing group on the nitrogen here and give you meta type of activation. Some of those methods are inspired by Jinquan Yu's work. But in terms of, well, for this particular case, the most reliable one that is sort of the easiest one to employ would simply be iridium borrelation because it's perfectly set up for it. And there's so much precedent for a one, two, three substituted aromatic giving selectivity away from all the substituents. So that's why it would be the go-to for me. Let's take a look at this bizarre example. That's now got a furan embedded in it, a dihydrofuran embedded with an indole. So we've got three ring systems. And I guess the question is, do we begin with a dihydrobenzofuran or we, do we begin with an indole? What do you think, Brendan? Sorry, could you, could you repeat the two, the two options? <clears throat> You say you say start with a furan or start with uh, an indole? What's our starting material? B, C, or A, B? Um, I think maybe, maybe C, B might be easier to do. And how do you want to get A? We'll put maybe nitro methyl like that. Yeah, maybe something like that. Okay. Uh, who who disagrees? Maybe Simona disagrees. Um, I was wondering if you could do an Anitsku because you have that um, alcohol there. So an Anitsku would, let's say, give us rise to. Um, this compound, and you're hoping that an R group will be there. Yeah. I, uh, like that, correct? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess the only issue is hoping that the regiochemistry will be right. Um, it could work. It's not a bad idea. And then you just have to um, put the right R group here. You've got to make a quinone that bears something like, you know, something that's ready to cyclize afterwards. Yeah. Sort of OTBS here because you don't want that thing to cyclize on itself. So maybe, I like what you're thinking there, Simona, because uh, it, it's a great, Ninitsky is always something you want to think about when you have a five hydroxy substituted indole. So that part is great. And even better is what it leads to in terms of thinking about starting with AB. If we start with AB instead, we've got OH here. You know, we can buy 5-hydroxy indole. Just, that's a bulk chemical. You can make it through 100 different ways. That's easy to get your hands on. Now the question is, what all we really need to do is append on here a carbon-carbon and a carbon-oxygen bond, and we're done, aren't we? 
Yeah. Now, are there good ways of doing this? Well, that's why we wrote the book. So um, you would go in the book and you would go to the section on directing group chemistry and look at that. If we have a five position directing group, it will prefer to go at the C4 position. It's right there in the book. So we can use that to realize that all we need here is a directing group. We can put a carbamate. We can put a TBS group here. We can then lithiate, put a halogen atom, cross couple with something, and this is all known, something like that, and then remove the directing group and cyclize. And you're done. So the, to me, that would be the preferred way to go, a ring substitution pathway from readily available 5-hydroxy and dull. Versus what Brendan suggested here, where I still don't really know how to make this. I'm going to have to go deep into the innards of SciFinder to find a good way. Whereas this, I don't need any SciFinder. Questions? All right, great. Let's go on to Les Call, a statin uh, that was commercialized, eventually taken off the market. It wasn't as efficacious as some of the other ones out there, but it was... Uh, Novartis's uh, first uh, inroads to the statin field. So we need ways of thinking about this compound. And um, in order to guide us through this, perhaps uh, we can get uh, Camille to give us any thoughts when she looks at this molecule. Anything at all. Possible. Um, you want to remove? Yeah, I think you could move the, remove the long chain. Uh, at the indole carbon. Hmm. Okay, let's get rid of that. And uh, what do you want to put in its place? Um, I guess you could just put like a bromine or something for cross coupling. That like that, for instance. Yeah. Okay. Certainly uh, looks reasonable. Is there another possible way of getting to this? Um. As a medicinal chemist, you know, you might look at this olefin. You decided to disconnect here, but you might also imagine disconnecting here as a medicinal chemist. Mm -hmm. And this can come back from the corresponding ester by a simple reduction. And so how would you put that together? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to alkylate to get rid of that isopropyl group. And then we need a good way of making that. What would be your favorite way of making that? Um, could you do a Hammett's burger? Well, the only issue with the Hammett's burger there is it will require that um, you start with that ketone. I suppose it could be fine. The problem is when you get that intermediate uh, vinyl azide, that intermediate then has two choices, doesn't it? It can do something here, or it can do something here, can't it? Oh, yeah, I see that. Oh, so we're kind of game over on that one. So instead, I guess one could simply do a fissure. And one could do it maybe from the, the alpha keto ester, 
or maybe one could simply use Hemmetsberger logic, like we talked about before, and treat this with uh, the diazonium, and that would also lead to the same intermediate hydrozone. Do you guys see that? Now, one big thing that's a problem that I didn't really talk about here is the step going from here to here. This alkylation is not a very good reaction, obviously. Isopropylation of an indole, it's not a very good nucleophile, and the isopropyl iodide is not a very good electrophile. And so the process chemists came up with a very different way of looking at this. Uh, and the first thing they looked at and they said is, well, probably this whole side chain can be installed through a simple, uh, electrophil simple electrophilic aromatic substitution. So they cut here. And uh, they kept the isopropyl on there. And their reagent of choice for installing uh, the key group where th that they needed was just a Vilsmeyer. Now, in order to, to put this together, they want to use a reaction that's going to retain the isopropyl group. And um, so for that, I guess we need to turn to problem of the day number two. What in that box of strategery is going to be a reaction that can enable us to install the isopropyl during the process or before the process of indole synthesis? Any suggestions? Maybe Kelly? Um, oh, who, who's, who? yeah, or Nyun? Yeah. What do you say? Um, I was thinking if you can form it from an inamide, let's say you have an either the CH or the C halogen bond, and you have an inamide with the, um, no, not that one, an, uh, an inamide, which is like the N and oh, the C triple oh, bond. Oh, 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 I see. Inamide, yes. So you're really, really wedded to that Laroc. You mean this? Um, yeah, something like that. Not necessarily have an NHD, but like, yeah, you can couple the NR and isopropyl, the, I mean, the, uh, the aniline nitrogen with the, let's say, phenyl acetylene to form the anamide. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Oh, okay, I get it. So the intermediate you're going to make looks like this. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, maybe, and you could probably take the acetylene, treat it with some sort of copper, and hope that you don't get any coupling at the wrong spot, and then you cyclize. Uh, Inamides are, are an interesting, or enum, you know, inamides are an interesting idea. You don't really see them used very often, and at least I've never seen them used in process chemistry, just because of the instability. But I want to take your idea, Nguyen, and I want to use something that is basically conceptually identical to what you just said. What you said is great, but I just want to change it a tiny bit. Now, I don't need an X because I'm just using, uh, it's a symmetrical, it's just phenyl there. So I don't care about my regiochemistry. And I'm using the innate reactivity of just a simple Friedel-Crafts. It's known as a Bischler cyclization, okay. right? So far more simple. I don't need any metals. I don't need any unstable intermediates. I don't need any halogen waste. I just al alkylate here, start with isopropyl aniline, treat it with acid, and I'm done. How do you like that? Well, so, in some sense, like uh, even like for a, a dynamite, like you don't need the halogen actually. Like let's say you treat the dynamite with the gold catalyst, you think it could proceed to an intramolecular cyclization. Maybe, but 
it, we're in process chemistry yeah. and photons are a lot cheaper than gold. So yeah, um, yeah, true. Yeah. So, you know, for, for a compound this simple, there's no, no need to go exotic or wacky. Yeah. Keep it, keep it simple. You know, process chemists, the, the best ones are going to be uh, using state of the art chemistry when they absolutely need to, when it takes synthesis from 15 steps to five or three, that's great. Break out all the fancy ligands and catalysts, but often the best process chemists get away with using things from the 19th century <laughs> when it comes to making heterocycles. So uh, try to keep it simple, especially when you're in the process land. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at MDL uh, 103371. And um, for this one, uh, we hopefully will have someone be able to guide us through it very quickly. Uh, maybe, um, maybe Kelly can help us out with this one. Sure. Um, can you append the side chain at C3 with like Novenangle chemistry? Awesome. And now? And then you can install that aldehyde with Felsmeyer. Brilliant. And now? And then use Fisher to build your indole. And a simple pyruvate, and you're done. Fantastic. Hey, so would this be medchem or process? I think either. How would you control the EZ uh, from the Novenagel? Uh, that's thermodynamically controlled. So in general, you're going to want to have, um, for conjugation's sake, this will generally, this arene will generally be E relative to the indole rather than Z. But I would say, unless the medicinal chemist wanted to do something different in terms of when they install their key diversifying functionality, both process or medchem could easily use a route like this. I mean, the only exception would be, let's say they wanted to put in, I can imagine a consulting question where they're like, well, we really want to put this arene in at the very end. And so you'd want to put a halogen there instead, somehow make a compound like that. So you could do Suzuki's all day, which should tolerate the chlorides without any problem. All right, great. Well, uh, why don't we um, move on to, before we, yeah, why don't we move on to um, some fun? Um, so you really can't talk about indoles without talking about psychedelics. Um, you know, I used to teach this class in this sort of closed setting where but now we're in the YouTube era, so I have to be very careful about what I say. So let's keep this to uh, synthesis. And um, if you are a chemist charged with making all these very interesting <laughs> tryptamine derivatives, <coughs> what would be your strategy to make it? Let's say if you were making it in a tool shed outside of your house, not that anyone that would do that. Start from tryptophan. An alkylate? Okay, so if you start from tryptophan and you alkylate, then you've got to do uh, some sort of decarboxylation later, right? You know, you can order tryptamine as well. So I, I, I would say you could use tryptophan, but probably even easier might be to just use tryptamine. Oh yeah, sure. And if you alkylate, you know, one of the issues of alkylation is of course over alkylation. You might make a lot of quaternary salts. Is there a way of getting these compounds sort of guaranteed without any ambiguity? Could you start from the acid do um, amide formation and then reduce. Uh -huh. And uh, even better corollary to that would be use the oxalate. 
and then full reduction. Uh, now, Nora, where does that come from? Just the Frito crafts, and I would say just a oxal chloride. Brilliant. Just a simple Frito crafts will give you that. <clears throat> Now, this is a very controversial area of science just because people have mixed feelings about these types of compounds in general. And I think something fun to note if you're interested in this area, which is, I guess, somewhat taboo, um, are a pair of books that are probably the most fun books I've got. Um, if, you're in, if you're at Scripps and you wanna borrow uh, these books, they're in my office. You can certainly take a look at them. Uh, TCAL and PCAL stand for Tryptamines I have known and loved, and phenethylamines I have known and loved. And um, it's a rather remarkable story. Alexander Shulgin, shown here with his wife. Uh, you know, these, these two are, are probably the, the most, uh, the biggest pioneers in the area of um, understanding psychedelics. Um, MDM therapy that's currently used now and accepted uh, was first developed uh, by these two at their house. Uh, Alex uh, is a uh, really pioneer of this area. He started off his career back at uh, DuPont, I believe, where he invented an insecticide. And it did so well, the company said, you know what, just do whatever you want. And he did. So he made a psychedelic that became so popular that they traced it back to his lab. Uh, it was during the 60s in the hippie era and uh, told him, hey, you know, we, we can't be associated with any of your chemistry anymore. So he went by himself and he started a lab at his house. Uh, and the amazing thing about these two books, for those of you that are organic chemists and love the field, is that they are written like organic synthesis chapters. So here are some chapters from the book. Um, here's one of the ones that I just showed you in that psychedelic box, uh, the dipropyl. And the dipropyl uh, one, or this is a diisopropyl one. Uh, he gives an orgsin prep. So you could do this yourself. Uh, you shouldn't, but you could. And uh, he goes further than just telling you how to purify and the characterization of it, but actually starts telling you what happens when various doses are ingested, which I think is remarkable. He lived to be 89 years old, so apparently this doing this didn't really hurt him. Um, you can read uh, what I have drawn here. Uh, you know, there's some really kind of uh, quite funny statements and it's one of the most fun books to read because imagine you make these compounds and then you start reading about what happens when you ingest them. Uh, that might be controversial today, but I would argue most chemists would fantasize about, you know, that. Uh, here's another one, famous one, uh, 5-methoxy DMT. This is one of the most famous psychedelics out there. And the whole prep is given along with uh, a lot of studies on what this thing can do. And uh, you, can, you can read a little bit of this if you want. Uh, apparently, the entire universe imploded through his consciousness when he tried some of this stuff. So some quite remarkable uh, findings. Here's another one, the perolidine one. And um, apparently, this one settled down in front of the TV to watch the rerun of Star Trek. That was it. And then if you read the next page, uh, he was just found sort of wandering down the street and, uh, you know, he, he has some very interesting descriptions of these compounds. So if you want to learn more about Shulgin and about psychedelics in general, one resource is we have a couple of group meetings on the topic. Another one is the famous uh, journalist and researcher Hamilton Morris and his uh, Pharmacopoeia show uh, is a really, really amazing TV show on that topic if you're interested. So it's kind of like energetics. It's a field that you don't necessarily, it's not really good to talk about it like psychedelics, but it's kind of an important area and I think appeals to the very nature of organic chemistry. All right, let's take a look at problem today number three. I need basically a shotgun approach to make this compound with as many methods as you can possibly come up with. So we want this to be rapid fire. Maybe uh, we can get a few people to just shout out some answers here. Aaron, Tiffany, who's speaking? Go ahead. Sorry, I said Lorac. Okay, next. Indole synthesis.
sorry, what was the next idea? Indole synthesis, Fish, Fisher indole synthesis, sorry. Next. Did you do a Frito Crafts alkylation and then uh, disconnect them like a Bartoli or whichever? Like that? Sure. Okay. Uh, any other suggestions? We have it. Yes. Sorry, could you use Matalong? And treat with base. And um, I, I guess as a corollary to that, you could think about Lime Group or Batchco. You need a hundred ways of making indoles, folks. I hope it's not redundant. You know, if if Fisher could work for everything or Laroc could work for everything, this lecture would be three minutes long. So you need all of these various ways of making these. It's critical. And you'll see some reasons why in just a moment. Okay, so now that you're indole masters, it should be very easy for you to rapidly uh, traverse through some of these compounds. So uh, how about this interesting intermediate here. I believe this one is from Lily. Who can we get to volunteer for this? I need some good disconnections. Uh, Kelly, you had a good disconnection for a compound like this before. Can you just start us off on what might be an initial knee-jerk disconnection? Sure, I would disconnect at C3. Great, let's get rid of that. And then also maybe the alkyl chain on the uh, four position. Okay, let's get rid of that too. Just put a methoxy to make things easier. And what next? Can you use Hemmetsberger here? Awesome, that should be fine. This comes from just a Frito Crafts. So Vilsmeyer should be fine there. So you certainly could do that, uh, especially knowing that it's very easy to exhaustively reduce an ester like that uh, down to the methyl group. Uh, you could also imagine that uh, we could disconnect the other way. So we could think about perhaps a hydrozone, and then doing some sort of fissure. That brings you back to some simple areas of which I think this disconnection is the fastest one just because that compound, as you will find, is extremely easy to access. Great. And uh, Simona has uh, kindly volunteered for a very rapid synthesis of this compound. Okay, I want to do the minuscule here. Yes, now it's time. So you have the benzoquinone and uh, you have your benzylamine on the um, left part of the scaffold. Brilliant. So we just take our natural product here is the ketone, make the enamine, and then dump in benzoquinone and get out the product. Can't think of a faster way of doing that. Now we're going to have a cage match between all three groups. We want all three teams to, to, uh, to think about this molecule. We've got the medicinal chemists, the process chemists, and even the radiochemists are all getting into the action here. 
to think of a way of making this compound, which I believe goes by the name of emerge. So, how about, let's see, we have medicinal chemists. So we have Sung Han, Nathan, Brendan, Taiwei, Ellie, Alex, Noor, Nick, Fang, and we have a bunch of process chemists, Kelly, Simona, Nyun, uh, Daniel, Carter, Junchen, Tanner, Shuang, Debbie, and then all the radio chemists, Tim, Tiffany, Aaron, Camille, Stone, Weekly. Uh, so someone from the medicinal chemistry team, can you give me a very quick knee-jerk disconnection? How about the uh, feature in the list? So I'm gonna uh, get rid of this group here. Just put a bromine there for now. Make this simple hydrazine and react it with Awesome. Now the process chemists upon seeing this frown and they say, oh, we don't want to do Fisher. The yield is too low. We get a lot of byproducts. We don't want to make that aldehyde on scale. We don't like this route. Where are the process chemists? Would you ever just want to alkylate at C3? That sounds great, Alex. And then when we treat this with our under heck conditions, then bubble in H2, we get out the product. How do you like them apples? Pretty fast, huh? All right, I hope the medicine, the uh, radio chemists are ready for us. Now, now you've been told this compound is going to make it all the way to an FDA approved medicine. We're going to, we're entering phase uh, two clinical studies. We're going to need to tell the FDA how this thing is metabolized. And we need a radio label with a C14 at the C2 position of eMERGE. And you need to eMERGE with an answer very quickly if you want to keep your job. So what strategies do we have? Where are the radio chemists? Who's gonna start speaking? All right, I'll, I'll take a stab. Let's hear it. Um, I was thinking of actually doing something like uh, the uh, Bashko Lime Gruber. I don't know if you can get radio labeled DMF DMA, or I think I said that right. Yeah, DMF yeah, DMA. You could, it, it, you can, yes. It's expensive, but you can. You wanna do that? Yes. And um, <clears throat> so now, now all you have to do is just figure out a way to make this compound quickly. <clears throat> I mean, it doesn't need to be quick. It could be low yielding and long, because it doesn't involve any radio labeled intermediate. So if you want to take seven steps to make that, by all means, go ahead. When you're a radio chemist, here's the trick. Uh, the first question I ask when I consult with a radio chemist is give me access to your process route. So I want to see all the intermediates that they've got because those are basically the commercially available materials. And often, one of the best ways of radio labeling something is just taking the API, that is the final compound. So the radio chemist that made radio labeled eMERGE made this compound simply from eMERGE. Now, I think when 
we were talking about uh, benzofurans. Someone, I think it was Brendan, asked, how are these things metabolized? And I went through a long diatribe of how those things are metabolized. And I went through benzothiophenes, I went through benzofurans, and I even went through indoles. And um, if we exhaustively oxidize an indole, if you recall during that lecture, I mentioned that what results is the formation of something called an N formal kynurenine. Kynurenines are naturally occurring uh, amino acids in your body derived from tryptophan. Your body, that's how it processes tryptophan and opens them up. So we can oxidize this with something like MCBBA and it will get us to the formal kynurenine. We can then treat this with labeled cyanide, very cheap. Once we do that, we get a cyanohydrin. which exists in an equilibrium with this. And if you treat this compound with uh, sodium cyanoborohydride, You lose ammonia, you lose water, but what remains is your C14 label. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? This is, is free. Is this sequence one pot what you're showing? Once you uh, have believe, the labeled cyano in there? I believe you can telescope the whole thing. Yep. So this, to the radiochemist, the eMERGE is free. That's the different way of thinking. You're thinking about opportunistic ways to very rapidly get that radio label compound because you'll never need to make it again. You make it once and then you're done. There's no kilogram synthesis scale synthesis of C14 labeled things I've ever seen. Question from the outside. Uh, actually, question from my end. So, what they're doing with the radio labels and stuff like that? They start with like C14 with like a dummy run, just try to like optimize on that. Or... The dummy run is usually with cold material yeah. using cold reagents, just to make sure they can recapitulate. After they do the cold material and they show that that route works, so they would practice this route by making the formal kynurenine, adding in cold cyanide, and seeing that they can get product. Then they would go forward with C14. The the C14, as I mentioned before, is really uh, a delicate process because every one of your waste streams has to be sequestered. So you want to minimize the number of steps you're doing with anything like that. And we have a guest lecture coming in later in the class to teach you all more about, well, to basically confirm that nothing I'm telling you is a lie. All right. So let's move on to Maxol. Uh, Phil, I have yeah. a quick question on this sure. point. Uh, can people label C14 on uh, like Gilbert surface reagent so that you can react with the aldehyde and to make, yeah, and then go to Laroque to uh, form your- Yeah, I have, I have seen that, uh, there, there's literature for that, but it's, it is really undesirable. Uh, I see. Because you have to, if you talk to a real radiochemist who does this, you know, if they have no choice, that's really the only way to do it, they will do it. But you really want to avoid, uh, as much as possible making label reagents because the chemistry is always much more messy. It's kind of a dirty secret. When you deal with these labeled compounds, they lead to a lot of strange byproducts that the cold chemistry does not. The yields are always lower. And so to make a hot reagent and then do a reaction is far less desirable than to make a formed late stage intermediate that you just add in cyanide, you just add in CO2, you add in something really cheap and then reclose it or reform it is gonna be far more desirable. But yeah, if you search, you will find a label version of Ohira Best and I've seen it. I see, thank you very much. Yeah, great question. Okay, do we have uh, a two second answer to Maxol? This is a uh, triptan used for migraines. It's funny that there's such a, a negative connotation around psychedelics, yet 
triptans can be used for migraines and sold by the pharmaceutical industry. Anyway, this is a good compound. So do you have a two second way of making it? Using the rock. Yeah. Fantastic. How about this compound from Lily? Maybe Simona? And it's Q. Fantastic. There was never any need for two indole lectures, right, Max? You were right. Uh, we're doing so well here. Let's take a look at problem day number five. Uh, I have a question yeah. about, would you worry about radio chemistry here? No, so uh, the, you're, you're going to use, uh, maybe I went too quick. Right, but you can form the enemy on either side, right? You can start with symmetrical or like, just like a beta keto ester and condensed with ammonia, right? And um, so if, you, yeah, okay. So if you're worried about the regiochemistry for this one, uh, you could do exactly what uh, Simona suggested where you put in, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Yeah, and then after that, during the Nanitsky process, it simply decarboxylates. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you introduce easily substitution on the benzaquinone for the Nanitsky? Okay, there's papers on this topic. We cover it in the book as well. It's not that reliable um, because, as you can imagine, there's so many electrophilic sites on a on a benzoquinone. But there have been papers on this topic of where you can use substituted benzoquinones. Uh, to get certain types of substitution patterns around the ring, but we don't teach it just because those examples are sporadic and not generalizable. But you will find some examples of that in the book when we cover it in this queue. It's a great question. Okay, thanks. But just be cautious in proposing those things. All right, problem that number five, we need some very quick, you can just shout them out, uh, quick ways. We have the given starting material and we just need the conditions for doing it. So for the first one, um, maybe, Castro. Part, oh, sorry, say that again. Castro. Second one. Not along, made long. Third one. Gaslin. Does everybody remember how the Gassman works? So we show it in the top box of strategery, but you usually take your aniline, you treat it with something like T-butyl hypochlorite or NCS will work as well. Um, that generates its n chloro species. Just a general question when you're drawing this out. Um, if you have like aromatic halides, will things like palladium on carbon remove any of those, like if it's iodine or anything like that? Uh, what, one, one second there, it's a good question. Um, so say that again, uh, Tim. Yeah, sure. I was just wondering with like a lot of these hydrogenation conditions for things like um, the gas one, for example, like will it ever remove aromatic aldehydes uh, like uh, iodines and things like that? Aromatic halides. Yeah, or okay. sulfur groups. Oh, well, you're skipping ahead. That's the product from the gas pit, correct? 
and you're asking the question, when I remove this sulfur, am I also going to remove things like an iodine here? Yeah, or if there yeah. was another sulfur on the aromatic or um, things like that. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a limitation of gaspin. Normally, you're going to use something like rainy nickel to remove this, and <clears throat> very likely iodides and some bromides are not going to tolerate the rainy nickel. So that is definitely an issue. Uh, one thing to remember about gaspin is that uh, you can take those intermediates though, and you can hydrolyze them. So these can also be converted into the corresponding uh, oxindoles or indoxyl derivatives. All right, great. Let's move on to problem of the day number six. We've got a number of very cool disconnections we can conceivably use here. And um, I suppose I could start us off with the obvious one. Let's first label these carbons to make everything much more easy. Those are the sort of carbons that are gonna be the key centerpiece of our discussion. And um, one of the obvious ones that everybody can call out is of course, a fissure. And uh, we generally call that an interrupted fissure because the product of that reaction is going to give you And you need to be very deft about doing this reaction so that when you get this intermediate, it is immediately reduced so that it doesn't do a ring shift expansion. So that's one way to put it together. I've, I've given you one disconnection, but there's at least three more that we can think of. Any other disconnections? And I've uh, labeled the carbons. How, yeah, what do you say, Nick? How, sorry, how would you pre prevent the ring shift? You would just be, you know, Sort of in C2 or... quenching, in C2 quenching with sodium cyanoborohydride or stab H, but in general, this is going to be. Would in... you have to cool it down? Yeah, you or... would. You would do it at as low of a temperature as you possibly can, and um, it is case specific. So sometimes you see this rearrangement happen really easily, and makes a fissure impossible. But in other cases, um, as was the case with this compound, you could actually get the interrupted fissure to work really well under the right conditions. Dump in a hydride in C2 and get out the desired spiro indoline. I see, okay. Uh, so Nick, since, you're, since I answered a question, maybe you can answer a question. Uh, can you give us a different disconnection? Um, yeah, sure, you could, for example, do um, two six disconnection and uh, do something like a... This was two six, so you have an alternative two six in mind. What is that alternative two six? Oh, sorry, that, that was, oh yeah, that, that was actually two six. Um, you, you can do could, another, there's another one. What's the other two six? You could, well, I was just thinking, um, um, yeah, you could potentially use palladium. Uh -huh. uh, yes, I knew you would say that. Although that might, I, that might not be advantageous to this first two six. Um, Why? Uh, even though, it, I mean, it's probably, even though you do avoid this uh, shift problem, um, I, I don't know how easy it would be to assemble compared to just taking the, you know, the, um, you know, hydrazine and uh, condensing it. Well, um, we just need optionality at this point. We don't need to worry about feasibility. That's a, a sort of second level uh, kind of analysis we want to run. Okay, yeah. And yeah. you could potentially also use the um, um, six four, I guess, disconnection or six five. Six four, six five. And that would require that we use some sort of... If you use an alkylation, yeah, if you, if you... Yeah, also viable, sure. Alex, were you gonna say something? Um, 
I guess it's pr- mm, similar to what he just showed, but something like starting with some sort of indole and like affording some kind of like thinking of it as like some kind of double alkylation essentially at what you have labeled as six. For sure. It's easy as done with the oxindole. It's more controllable. There's another sort of starting with an indole idea we could consider. You could always treat this with an oxidant and then have the ring contraction happen. That's another strategy people have used. Something like MCVBA and a little bit of acid could give you the right product. Okay. There are others, if you think of them, uh, you're welcome to shout them out. But I think, you know, we've done a good job of chopping up this molecule. So let's move on. How about this? Um, yep. To, to just say, a quick question. Uh, yeah. In the palladium catalog strategy, like, will it form the five membrane or the six membrane, given that the alking is like, um, is the electron withdrawing is on the other side. So like the polarity of the alking yeah. should. It's a good point. While the polarity is r- r- not right, um, endo hex are very difficult to accomplish. And normally you'll get the exo product. Um, so there are ways of getting around that to make endo through a bypass pathway. But for geometrical reasons, you can't get a direct hex to go endo. They always go exo normally. Would it be it basically like, an, would it be uh, electronically driven at this point, so like an alpha beta? Uh, effect. Well, it, it's just proximity driven at this point. You've got a pie system and you get sort of, you know, an Overman has pioneered this kind of strategy to get this kind of intramolecular cyclization to go. And, you know, because you can't get the endo very easily, you'll get the exo as a result. Okay. It's just geometrical reasons. All right. Uh, how about this compound from Lily? We need a very fast disconnection of this. Um, and what is the most complicated thing about this molecule when you first look at it, Daniel? If one of those three rings is weird. The C ring. So how would I get rid of it really quick? Can you imagine there might be an alkylation event that we could use? Yeah, so maybe between six and five. Well, from six and five, we're definitely going to need to to have that as part of our starting material at a certain point. Okay. But what what I want to do is make the easiest bonds possible through alkylation, and to me, that would be getting rid of one and two right away, and then imagining that five and four maybe could come from reductive emanation, and so that leads us back to basically that or some sort of protected, some acetal, right? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Now I need a fast way of making that. Suggestions? Could you start with the- Oh, somebody said it. Say it again, who said it? Bartoli. And what were you saying, Tim? I was actually wondering if you could start with the 2,6 uh, dimethyl nitro and then do um, uh, the Batchko, if that would cyclize selectively on one and then you'd have your imine on the other and then hydrolyze that off. Hmm. That's clever. We've never seen that one before. Yeah, we should send some doge for that. That's a clever idea. Um, The product of that would be
that, and then you do some sort of benzylic oxidation of the methyl group. I like it. What do you say, TAs? Do you like it? They, they all agree with you. That's a good idea, Tim. One we have not seen so far. Uh, very clever, taking advantage of the innate symmetry there. But the Bartoli is good too. And the key thing about the Bartoli to remember is the signaling element. When I look at Bartoli, when I remember or think about the possibility of using Bartoli, the first thing I think about is a substituent in the C7 position. It needs to be blocked with an ortho substituent. If there's no substituent here at seven, Bartoli doesn't work very well. All right, great. Well, we're coming down to the last- Wait, uh, just to stay there, um, could you also think about using something like the Gasman? Like, why? Yeah, you sure, you sure okay. could. Okay. Yeah. okay. The, you could definitely propose Gasman. Okay. Yep. Um, and let's take a look at uh, problem of the day number seven. We've got about five minutes left. So hopefully these will be very rapid shotgun ideas before we get to uh, radio labeling. You can just call them out if you like. Did you do a Castro and then uh, NBS and methylate? That's one idea. Would Hemitsberger be good here? That's another idea. Not alone. That's another idea. All good suggestions. Uh, and you might even think about Lime Grouper as well. Also fine. Great. How about the next one? Bartoli. And finally, this one's confusing and difficult, right? And I get these ones often in consulting. So 10 years ago, the only thing I could tell you to try would be something like this. Take that starting material and use either Gasman or maybe Sandmeyer, which goes by the intermediacy of uh, hydroxylamine and chloral. You could look at the mechanism of that in the 2019 edition of this class. And the old, always the age old problem would be where does it go, here or here? That was the problem I had. But now there's a new way. From the consulting corner, Simona learned that we now can make this compound how? The borylation chemistry, does that work here? Brilliant. Now we're good. A lot easier to think about ways of making this compound and at the end borylating and then copper iodide and you're done. So, so for making yep. that compound, um, the diketone, would you do something with, uh, I don't know what to call that, like maybe like an oxidindole and then use that oxygen to direct this, like a second oxidative event? These are isotins and they can be actually derived from the corresponding indole. Okay. Okay, and they, we have conditions. In one that. step? Uh, usually, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a two-step protocol, but yeah, there's a lot of methods out there for going to isotin from an indole. Um, you can also do it through methylation strategies and you know, there's, there's a number of ways of, of getting to isotins. Um, great, all right, well, we have uh, well, we're actually out of time, but we'll spend hopefully 
two more minutes just solving problem of the day number eight. We don't want to leave all those radio chemists out. And um, so hopefully they can very rapidly tell us how we can make what we've learned today. How can you make that in two seconds? Where are the radio chemists? We just learned it. I guess you could do the opening and then use the cyanide. Okay, great. And how about B? Nanitsky with uh, um, radio labeled uh, formaldehyde. Okay, great. And finally. I thought DMF, DMA, but that's probably too expensive. No, well, you, you get away with that. Fantastic. Okay, as I mentioned, indoles have been completely revitalized. We're not gonna talk about, uh, we're not gonna have an additional lecture on indoles. There's some other content that you can look at the 2019 series to, to uh, learn about. We're gonna go on to pyridines on Wednesday and then an all new lecture on Friday on uh, our first exposure to fused ring systems, the as indoles and related structures, which are probably the most important uh, of the indoles you will ever see in the real world. So with that, uh, have a great rest of the day and we'll see you on Wednesday, thanks.